Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Soccer Queens podcast. I have Emily Neff back as another repeat guest, and you guys probably know her from before. She is an amazing performance coach to female athletes in Pennsylvania, and she is an owner of an all-female athlete performance facility. So Emily, welcome back. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here for today's conversation. So, so excited. And we have been just like going back and forth and we're going to discuss the growth spurt in youth female athletes today. And this is going to be a very unique episode. You guys, we're going to really walk you through this time period in a young female athlete's life. And we're going to be doing some screen shares and sharing some of our programming for our young female athletes going through the growth spur and just kind of the pathway that we take them on pre growth spur and during the growth spur and what's going on during this time. So I'll just kind of kick things off. So the, the fancy term for the, the growth spurt is peak height velocity. That's the scientific term. And we can just simplify it as the period of time when a young girl experiences the most rapid rate in upward growth of her stature. And this tends to happen during ages 10 to 14, but on average, it occurs the most in girls around age 11 and 12 years old. So there's a lot of stuff that happens before this time and what we should be focusing on. So Emily, if you just want to get into the pre PHV and then we'll just go from there. Yes. So exactly how we want to look at this is like, what's our pre PHV. I like to say, what's our peri PHV, like around it, that's including puberty. And then what's our post in terms of like, after all of that years after where are we at? So when we think of pre-PHV, we want to think of like our kids. They're, this is what we define as childhood in literature. So this is when our kids are going to be, in science terms, neurally pliable, because this is when their brain is at one of its most upward growth. So this means that we can really take advantage of the fact that they are so pliable in learning new things, specifically motor skills. And this is what's going to allow us to create some type of synergistic adaptation, meaning we are jumping in on what the body is already changing. And we can allow these athletes to actually improve their movement qualities at a much faster rate when we're introducing movement qualities pre PHV. So this is really one we want to focus on quality over quantity in terms of our general movement pattern. So when we're trying to develop youth, I like to always remind our coaches, our parents, that we have a couple things that we want to focus on. We want to develop a little bit of coordination and rhythm because again, this is when they're so neurally pliable. We want to develop our general movement pattern. So that's going to be how do we squat? How do we hip hinge? How do we press? How do we pull? How do we lunge? How do we carry? How do we stabilize? These are all of our fundamental movement patterns that are going to carry over to sport and just life. We also want to focus on improving relative strength. So meaning strength relative to their body weight, because again, developing this now is going to allow these athletes to maintain that relative strength over the years as their body structures start to change with puberty. Um, We want to improve their reactive elastic qualities because at this point we have to remember because our kids are growing, they're very lax. Their ligaments are lax. And and that's what we want because if they weren't lax, their bodies wouldn't grow quite as lovely as they currently do. So with that, we have to understand that laxity is something that we have to acknowledge at this age And we don't want to really fight it in the sense of, oh my goodness, she's so lax. We can't have this. No, like that's good. Her body is growing, but we also want to make sure that we start to introduce some type of reactive element in terms of those tendons and ligaments qualities, because that's something that they are lacking. And again, by introducing something like pogos, hops, skips, these fun movement patterns, we're working on these reactive qualities 
without actually being so specific in terms of like, what's your agility? What are we doing here? No, they are kids. Let's teach them how to hop, skip on one leg, do some pogos, do fun things that are going to benefit them in the long run. And then lastly, the most important part, we have to make sure these kids are loving sport and training. Because if we are creating scenarios where these kids are burnt out and think of training as a job, we are not going to allow, we're not creating this sense of love and this experience, and they're not going to stick with it as they get older. And honestly, at the end of the day, the best training programs are the programs at which a child to an adult stay consistent with. It doesn't matter how your X's and O's are written in your program. If these athletes aren't consistent because they're burnt out, because they're tired, because they're always getting injured, you will never have success. So during this period, we have to remember that they are growing and they're also, their recoverability is very high and that's great because they're kids and they should be, their recoverability should be very high because of this fact that their bodies are growing and under so much stress that their ability to recover from and adapt and grow, that's what makes them so plastic. But with that, we also have to be very cognizant that they're still a human and stress is stress and they can only handle so much stress. So when we think, okay, these kids are very, they're very, they have a high recoverability. There's also a ceiling and we don't want to break that ceiling. So for instance, if we're introducing this age group to this type of training, this shouldn't be in addition this should be something that we are replacing an extra sport, an extra competition, an extra skill set. Because let's say these kids, let's say they're six to eight years old. Do we need to do extra batting lessons right now? Or do we need to make sure these kids understand how to move, how to hop, how to jump, how to love, how to love their sport, how to love their bodies? Because if we develop that now, In the future, when they start doing batting lessons, they'll actually be able to acquire the skill of batting so much faster because we took advantage of that neurally plastic time in terms of how we to develop body awareness, how we got that coordination and rhythm. Because if we don't establish that, your kid is never going to swing the way you want her to. She's never going to pitch the way you want to. So we want to focus on the fundamentals during this time period. I am so glad you went into all of that with the the fundamental movement patterns and the movement skills that athletes just need to develop a base of. They need to become well-rounded athletes and good moving humans first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you with some of the girls you've worked with who are in that pre-PHB period, but I'll have some girls who come to me and they can't even balance on one leg for 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then the parent is asking me for an advanced speed program. And it's like, we're not, we're not there yet because balance is a part of speed, her being able to be coordinated or even to perform a basic cartwheel or have rhythm is a part of speed. I can't Mm -hmm. take you from, from calculus first (laughs) when, when you don't even have your, your basis of the addition and the subtraction. So Mm -hmm. it's funny because this, this relates to school curriculums and we always have to start general and global Mm -hmm. with, with these young Mm -hmm. ones. And you also mentioned the, the aspect of fun and we have to look at the, uh, the emotional needs of this age group. And we don't want them to see sport and training as an obligation. It needs to be fun. It needs to bring them joy. Mm -hmm. And, and what more joy than doing like fun games with a variety of movement where Mm -hmm. they have to problem solve, where they have to react to a stimulus. Mm -hmm. They don't need these rehearsed drills like the older girls have where you're Mm -hmm. really cueing them and working on the details of their sprint form. Like you don't need to do that with a pre PHV female athlete. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'll have some people argue, well, you should teach them running mechanics as young as possible. And it's like, no, they're, they're not ready for that. They just Mm want to race. They want to chase. (laughs) So what are, what are your thoughts on speed training for the pre PHB? So we're talking prior to age 11, 12. Mm -hmm. So one, I'm so glad you brought up that analogy because it's so true. We, we often forget that sport 
is a byproduct of human movement. And if we don't develop a, a foundation of human movement, we will never be able to excel in our sport. Too often, we're trying to get this athlete into this highest level possible, and we're skipping the foundation. Like you said, we can't go to calculus if you don't know how to add. We can't, we can't even do multiplication if you don't know, can't add. And speed work is something that understandably coaches and, and parents want for their kids because it looks like their sport. And they think, oh, well, my kid is pretty slow. I'd like her to get faster. We should practice that thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yes, I totally understand why you feel this way. However, at this age group, by practicing the thing, we're only going to get her here. But if we work on all the other things, we're going to get her here. The things from which speed derive from. How much force can I put in the floor? Do I have coordination? Do I have body awareness? Do I have balance? Do I have stability? Because without these fundamental characteristics, I'm never actually going to be able to produce the most maximum amount of force over whatever spe specific time period. So within this age group, we actually want to stay away from specific type of training and instead do types of training that allow for fun and exploration. So when it comes to introducing these movement patterns, I always like to remind, you know, coaches and athletes and parents that your kid is not fragile. She's meant to explore. Her body needs to explore the movement. So yeah, did she pick up something with a rounded back? That's okay. Do we want to make it more efficient in time? Absolutely. But if we are so worried and we're fearing athletes away from positions, they're never actually able to explore the positions. And movement exploration is one of the most fundamental characteristics of body awareness and being able to get to that high level of movement efficiency. But first we need to explore. And that's through teaching movement patterns, but doing so, making sure the weight's not too high, the volume's not too high, and it's fun. Because if we're not having fun, they're never going to stick with it. And they're never able to actually adapt over time. I'm going to share my screen here and just um, summarize this real quick for everyone. Bear with me, everyone. Okay. So this, this basically sums up what Emily and I just, just talked about. So this is a very popular graphic that was created by um, Lloyd and Oliver. They're some of the leaders in the long-term physical development space. Another one I really like is Avery Fagenbaum. So please be sure in the caption below, I'm going to include all the links to their work and their studies, as well as this graphic. So you guys can refer back to it. But when, when we look at the, the years pre PHV before age 11, 12, you see that it's a lot of fundamental movement skills. That's going to be the, the dominating force in training. And Emily already mentioned a few of them, but hopping, skipping, throwing, catching. And even if they're a soccer player and they're using their lower body, they still need to learn throwing and catching and hanging and climbing and crawling and just really developing all of their muscle groups and just this great body awareness and being able to keep their head up in soccer. It just enhances those sport specific skills that they're going to have time for later in, in their teenage years. So that's when the sport specific skills start to take over post PHV. So just want to just reiterate how important it is to just expose these young kids to a variety of movement. And like Emily said, allow them to explore and they're only going to raise the ceiling on their athleticism, which is then going to help with their sport specific skills. So Emily, mm -hmm. is there anything you want to add on to this graphic? Yes. Yeah, so the only other thing that I would want to bring up is that too often we forget that, okay, well, this graphic says I have to do this and my kid is 15. But here's the thing. If your kid never was exposed to these movement patterns, she can't start at, at where, you know, we're saying, Hey, when you're 15, let's focus on strength, speed, agility, sports mm -hmm. specificity. It's like, no, 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 we can't get there yet. We still have to follow this model. She may, her adaptation to it may be different compared to an athlete that's still pre-PHV. But 
if we don't develop the foundation, regardless of the age, we're never going to be able to actually reach that peak. Too often we see athletes that are post PHV that have never done this before. And they come in and they have no ability to hip hinge, no ability to stabilize. Same conversations will occur. A parent says, I want my kid to get faster. She needs a very specific speed training program. And we say, okay, well, excellent. Right now we still have to, we're still focused on teaching her how to stabilize her pelvis because with, before we can do that, we're never going to be able to have higher speed outputs because all of her speed, all of that energy will be wasted because of so much rotation of her torso. We need to develop the foundation movement patterns and body awareness first. And honestly, it takes a lot longer to do that if we wait post PHV, because these athletes have now spent certain amount of years developing specific movement patterns that have never been explored and never been made more efficient. So it's like, we actually have to backtrack. So the kids that start in this model pre PHV will be able to reach that sport specific goal that they have much sooner than an athlete that never is exposed to this until post PHV. That's such a good point. And as far as this graphic, this is the ideal situation. And we're assuming that everyone's worked on the fundamental movement skills pre PHV. But like Emily said, there are going to be some girls that don't do this type of training until they're 14, 15. I've had some 16 year old girls get into the gym and do a speed program for the first time. And they're running same arm, same leg. And there there's no coordination ability there. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not going to load their sprints or do velocity based work right away because they're not even coordinated enough. So mm -hmm. we also have to pay attention to that training age, right, Emily? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I like to say, I love models like this because they help explain, you know, these theoretical constructs, but at the same time, training age is often much more important than chronological age or age from puberty because training age is going to trump all. So mm -hmm. If their training age is zero and they are 21, we're going to start with basic movement patterns and develop coordination and rhythm. We're not going to jump into some very specific sport because if we do sports skill work and like specific speed and agility stuff, because that's not going to enhance what you're looking to enhance at the rate that I could, if we focus on the foundations first, and it's such a difficult conversation because parents and coaches when they see training, they think training must look like their sport. And they forget that as, as strength and conditioning coaches, our job is to develop the physiological qualities that are the foundation of the skills of their sport. If you want to get good at your sport, play your sport. If you want to improve your running speed, your ability to change direction, your ability to cut, your ability to react, you have to develop the physiological characteristics that drive those skills. Let's talk about the movement patterns with uh, pre PHV. So the, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but a lot of parents are like, when should my girl start with a performance coach? And I'm like pre PHV, they can mm -hmm. start learning the movement patterns in our speed and agility sessions. They're going to look a lot different than our older girls. They're still, we're still going to focus on speed and agility, but it's going to be fun. The games are going to mm -hmm. look a little bit different, but we can also still teach proper technique with body weight. So I'm just going to share, um, a few videos. Um, let's see, let me, we talked about the hip hinge. So this one, uh, I just want to preface that this girl, and I'm, I'm kind of sad. I don't have like a before video, but her hip hinge was not good <laughs> to start. And she's in seventh grade and she did her hip hinge and it was the slouching of the shoulders, the curved spine. And now just one month later, this is where we're at. Um, let me just expand this. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So the, the hip hinge guys is just teaching girls how to hinge at the hip. So it's, it's not a squat. There's only going to be a very soft knee bend and it's more of the hips piking back. And of course, this is the foundation to our deadlift and eventually loading this, which we'll show you later and to really build the hamstrings and the glutes. But this is also a movement. That's the foundation of deceleration and change of direction. And I also like to call it athletic stance. I don't know if that's Wait, what you, you like to thing. call it. Yeah. So I'll, yeah. I'll just show, play the video real quick and it keep in mind, this is just a month after training and it just shows 
how, how plastic this age group is. Mm-hmm. And at first she was doing a very squatty movement. Mm-hmm. And yesterday she actually came in and we had, we were doing dumbbells and she was bending the knees a lot less. And it's just, even in a couple months time, it's like, oh my gosh, we can start to load her. Cause she picked it up so fast. Mm-hmm. Is there anything exactly. else you want to add with the hip hinge? Um, honestly, just, just in terms of movement, there's movement the bottom position. patterns and all of that. What we found most successful really relates to what we find in research in terms of motor skill acquisition is that we want to do a lot of, so there's two different types of learning, implicit and explicit. Explicit is like, all right, so I want you to make sure in a squat that you're driving your knees here and you're sitting here versus implicit is like, all right, um, here is something on the ground. I want you to sit down, pick it up and stand. And that allows that movement exploration and allows them to find that movement position. And that's what we have found. And again, with, with research, it correlates to that showing that we actually lead to long-term faster acquisition of the movement powder. It might be slower in the movement itself, like in that teaching format, it might take them some time compared to telling them exactly what to do, but that movement pattern is retained over time when we focus on those, um, implicit learning strategies focused on like even just external cues. So like using, like if I'm teaching a hip hinge, I'm going to have an athlete get set with the the wall behind her. All right, reach your butt to the wall, tap it. And that way it's a goal outside of themselves. And that's going to allow a little bit better acquisition of movement. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it important to do these movement patterns without load first. And because I've seen a lot of parents say that they went to a CrossFit trainer and they were loading the girls right off the bat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yay. Um, so load is an interesting conversation because it's like, well, what is load? Because at seventh grade, you're still have a backpack and you still are picking things up and you're still putting things down. So when we're talking about load, when we talk about loading, it means you're actually putting the body under enough resistance that it's going to drive some type of structural change. So when we talk about teaching an athlete a movement, we might go body weight. We might use a very light load, but that light load is going to actually more so act more as a counterbalance or Mm -hmm. just a way for them to feel their body more. But the intensity being used isn't high enough to really induce that structural damage. Mm -hmm. And I like to have just thinking it common sense wise, like how heavy is that kettlebell compared to her backpack? How heavy is that five pound plate compared to, you know, something that she's putting on the shelf or her lacrosse stick and every time she's throwing and she's in seventh grade. So the loads that we want to use in teaching should be enough so the athlete can feel but not too much that it's causing slow velocity of the movement, movement breakdown over time. Instead, each rep should get better. And that's how you know you're using a load that is enough for them to feel or counterbalance type. Like let's say my athlete can't figure out how to squat without her torso falling over. We're going to hold a five pound plate right here. But five pound plate is great because this athlete weighs 95 pounds compared to maybe an athlete. She's young, but she weighs 135. Maybe I'll use a 10 pound plate because relatively it's still light enough that it's not going to induce these structural damage because they're not there yet. I can't load her to that extent yet. Instead, I want to use load as a type of way of helping my athlete feel a movement pattern, but not enough in that the movement breakdown breaks down over reps Mm -hmm. and the velocity of the movement slows. If you're seeing those, the load is inappropriate for the athlete in terms of what you're teaching. Load should only be used to help improve the movement and that the movement is getting better as, as volume goes over time. If it's getting worse, we're not doing the right thing here. Now with your pre PHV girls, how often are you loading them and what are sort of the, the weight ranges? Are you having them hang out at body weight and just reinforce the movement pattern for a couple months, couple of weeks? Like what, what does it look like for you? Because we don't have a lot of studies on this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there, there's studies on what goes on during pre-PHV and during PHV, but there's no programming studies on yeah. what performance coaches should be doing. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're going off of experience based and what we're, we're seeing our athletes. So what, what are your rules of thumb for your programming for this group? So we typically 
we're not going to stay just body weight because body weight is not going to provide a type of external um, stimulus when it comes to motor skill acquisition. So I'm, I typically don't stick to just body weight because it's very difficult for the athlete to actually develop that body awareness. Mm -hmm. But instead, the loads, like I said, are going to be very low relative to what she's using in daily life. So plate, like a five pound plate. Um, heaviest maybe is like a 15 pound kettlebell or at most she's like doing a little hip hinge deadlift off of a high block with like a little bit of like a load. But again, remember the high block means her hip hinge will only be here. So we're not really loading her throughout the full range of motion and said, it's enough load to feel it. So again, it's hard to give a specific, uh, loading number because it's going to depend on your athlete's size relative to what she's doing in life, but all of our loads are going to be very small compared to what they're doing outside of here. Um, just enough to allow for that movement quality to enhance. And here's the thing, as the move, as we like to say, first job is to teach movement competency. What is a squat? What is a hinge? Does she come back and does she confuse them? She's not competent in them yet. We're not increasing weight. We are still ingrating that. Is she efficient? Cool. She understands the differences between a squat and a hinge, but that squat looks not great after rep four. So lovely. We're not going to ch change the load. Instead, we have to improve that efficiency, which how do we do that? Exposure and frequency. We have to do it a little bit more. Hey, you're coming one time a week. I think you're going to learn the movements a little faster. If I see you twice a week, it's going to double your exposure. And then from there, once we establish that we have movement competency and movement efficiency, now it's time to expose that athlete to that movement endurance. So now it's like, great. You do it for six reps beautifully. Can we do it for 10? Can we do it for 12? Let me see you establish that lovely. Now it's time to implement some type of heavier loads. But again, the heavier loads will only be heavy enough to stimulate some type of strength because we can still get stronger. Our tissues will still adapt. Mm -hmm. However, our rate of strength improvement will never be what it is pre-PVH to what it is post-PVH because we have different hormones in our bodies and we have to remember that. But Remember when you're young, you're still making a lot of neurological. When I mean young, I mean young to training. You have a lot of neurological gains. So, hey, we started with a five pound plate, but she can do these for like 15 reps and then they look easy. And like, literally they're nothing what they used to be. It's time to go to 10. And it's not because she put on more muscle mass. It's because she's figured out how to use more of her muscles together. And that's where our loads are going to increase because you're looking at, well, the speed of that movement is ridiculous. Like this is not even challenging. And if it's not challenging enough for me to feel it, I can't actually build upon it. So it's going to, again, be very dependent on the individual. If she's coming one time a week, we're not going to hit that improvement rate compared to a, a young pre PHV athlete that's coming in twice a week or three mm -hmm. times a week. And if we're doing that much frequency, we're going to make sure the loads are fairly light, but instead we're going to, our end goal is lovely. Is she moving beautiful? Is she moving well? Does she remember these movements? And can we do them with volume? Lovely. Now it's time to increase load a little bit and let's do the same thing all over again. And it's just like that layering effect. And that's really where you got to hang out and you got to hang out with like, cool. She knows how to hip hinge. She knows how to squat. She needs to do all this other stuff. Now it's time to learn how to hip hinge on one leg back to ground zero back to, okay. Are we just using the wall? And like, maybe we're holding a five pound plate to like help guide where that back hip should be. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Can we, should we increase? Can we increase the volume? Can we do it? We did it for three beautiful reps. Can we do it for six? Can we now do it for 10? Can we maintain that over five sets? And that's where we're going to hang out until really that Perry PHB time. We're going to get into that shortly, but I think that really just confirms that this age group, it's, it's great to have a strength coach who, who knows how to progress and add load or just add more reps and make sure that she's efficient and skillful in these movements. So I, I definitely encourage you guys, at least if you have a middle school athlete to strongly consider it. And Emily, would you say that if this age group starts learning strength training in sixth, seventh grade, then 
come high school, they're just going to be blossoming and oh they God. might actually even be a little bit ahead of the pack <laughs> because we don't have to start them from square one. Mm-hmm. They absolutely will be ahead of the, the, the pack. And, uh, I love that you brought up Avery Fang and bomb. Cause he's like fantastic when it comes to anything youth strength training. And he's been part of so many reviews. Um, um, in some of these reviews where they're discussing that, you know, we used to keep kids away from strength training because we thought it stunted their growth. And now we realize, okay, that's wrong. It doesn't stunt their growth. Instead, it actually helps enhance the movement qualities, their bone structure, how these athletes go through PHB and purity and all of these changes, especially female athletes. We see that pre exposure pre PHV is going to allow for enhancement of all of the qualities of strength power so much faster than if we waited until after this athlete is around that pubescent time. And that's too late. It's never too late to get involved in it, but you can be, like you said, ahead of the game. If we're introducing them to our athletes pre PHV, because it's like, you got the basics covered. You got the basics down pack pH feeds time to hit lovely. Now we have a good different type of hormonal structure within us. Now it's time to really get to work because we already put the basics in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes that PHV time a little less of a a panic moment (laughs) because Mm -hmm. the, the girl is equipped. She, she knows how to move her body and she can continue to build her strength and Mm -hmm. actually take advantage during that time, because a lot of crazy things can happen. So let's get into that. What happens during PHV? And again, guys, this is the growth spurt. This is when adults are saying, oh my gosh, she shot up like a weed. That's Mm -hmm. this time. So Mm -hmm. what happens? (laughs) So I love how you, how you define it. It is. It's just, it's just when your kid is like, oh my goodness, how did you get so tall? Mm -hmm. Um, so for female athletes specifically, you're going to hit PHV and then in within about a year, that's when your athlete will probably get her onset of menses. So that's something to keep in mind when a lot of times I think sometimes people confuse PHV with the onset of puberty. And it's like, yes, puberty is coming, but we're not going to get our menses yet. Like we're not there yet, but because characteristics, we have a great, huge spike in laxity. Everything is lax as it should be because your bones have just grown ridiculously for female athletes. We're going to see a decrease in performance because we have an increase in neural muscular um, dysfunctions. What does that mean? It means as the athlete, your female athlete has this huge growth spurt, her height increases and her body fat is going to increase because her body fat needs to increase because she is becoming a woman. And we need a little bit of more cushion because we have to do so many things with our bodies. So with that spike in height, there's not a concurrent spike in muscle mass. So with that, we're going to see it's for lack of a better word, that awkward, that awkward movement pattern. A lot of times I have parents coming like my daughter just like, looks like she doesn't know how to move her limbs where it's like, yeah, because her bones just grew so fast and the amount of muscles to, to match those bones have it. And right. that's normal. That's when we're going to see these injuries that are like, Oh, like her tendons and ligaments are inflamed. I hate calling Oscar slaughters a disease because it is not a disease. It is just tendonitis guys. And it happens when we're growing because again, our bones are growing and our muscles aren't growing to the same extent. So we have a big pool of that tendon that inserts into the knee. And that's going to be cause a lot of inflammation. And you might have that little bump show up and, and that's, it's, it's pretty typical, especially if her athlete is, is grew at a really fast rate and she's really active. It just means that she's in a state of inflammation and we need to get stronger to allow that tendon to kind of chill out a little bit. So during this time, same thing when we talked about that synergistic adaptations, we can really take advantage of that now because if we involve strength training at this PHV period, we actually get to introduce an artificial neuromuscular spurt. Remember I said that we are going to experience neuromuscular dysfunctions. And that's because again, we have this disconnect between body, bone growth, body fat accumulation, and not a match in strength. And if we introduce a type of strength training, we are going to allow the body to understand 
One, how to get stronger because we are learning how to activate more of these muscle fibers within whatever muscle you have, as well as how to grow a couple more muscle fibers. Um, we just did a post prior that was like during puberty, females are going to attain about like three kilograms of muscle mass compared to boys that are going to accumulate about like seven and a half kilograms. So um, for many people that go pounds, six, three kilograms is going to be like, so that's 2.2, what is like about like eight pounds. And then seven is going to be about like 16 ish pounds. So that's a significant difference. Um, for the parents that are like, well, I don't want my daughter to get bulky. Okay. So think, so, so what do we say about seven pounds in puberty research shows that female athletes can really only accumulate about two pounds of muscle mass a year. That's not a lot of bulk. Did she get bulky during puberty? Because puberty, remember, she gained more muscle. And that's not even that much muscle compared to the boys. So if she's not going to get bulky during that period, we have to stop thinking that we're going to get bulky by doing regular strength training, you know, two to four times a week over the course of this adolescence. It's not going to happen. Two pounds is one kilogram. So not that much. But what we are going to see is we're going to see an improvement of motor skills and an improvement of muscle mass, meaning we're moving our bodies better and more efficiently because we have more control over them. Um, I think one of the most specific research studies that we have that kind of compared males versus females when it comes to puberty, um, it's we see that during puberty, boys are going to demonstrate increasing increasing performance of vertical jump, change in direction, speed, and an improved lower limb biomechanics. Females don't. Well, females, again, remember, we don't have that increase in muscle mass, but our bodies are bigger. So that means we have less force to move our bodies through space. So of course, we're not going to get better in that. And boys will. Most specifically, we see that, interestingly, in during this puberty, state, we're going to see compared to males, females are going to have a um, decrease in their amount of like hip abduction, meaning, mm -hmm. meaning we just have less control. And really interesting, we have less strength in our quadriceps, which I think is a really important detail to point out because we still live within this like historic literature where it's like all females are quad dominant, only strength of their hamstrings and their glutes. We got to focus on it. Where it's like, but research says during puberty, we literally have weaker ha weaker quads. So obviously we need to focus on that. And that plays a role in the, the tendonitis in the knee too. Is that weak Absolutely. quad? It's Absolutely. It's crazy. We're, we're like living in the seventies here. We, <laughs> we really, are the, like, the amount of times that you have people, oh yeah, like, like even some recent research for like citing things back from the eighties and nineties, like, yeah, yeah. remember. Yeah girls are quad dominant. And it's like, have you worked with any female athletes? Because over the past seven years, only working with female athletes, I have seen the opposite. I've seen a lot of strength in the hip or hip movement patterns, posterior chain, and almost no strength anteriorly. And that kind of correlates back to what we're seeing in the research that when these girls go through puberty, they have a significant decrease in quadriceps strength. So yeah. we have to make up for that. And, and if these kids are still playing the same sport, but her quads have actually decreased in strength, of course, she's at an increased risk of injury. So these are some really important qualities that we have to focus on. And I think what you kind of said earlier too, is that, you know, we have some kids that are going to CrossFit and they're just like doing like random, random lifts and like at, at different weights. And it's like, well, because those coaches don't have enough knowledge on working with that age group. And so they shouldn't because then you need, you are working with athletes that are extremely pliable and extreme. They're trying to learn and we have to focus on where they're at and give them good programming, not random kids should not be receiving random. They need yes. focus. The, I do want to just expound on that point. And a, a lot of athletes or even parents will be like, well, why isn't the program changing? And when we're talking skill acquisition and learning the movement patterns, and then eventually loading them, you're likely going to be doing 
the same movements over and over again, Mm -hmm. but you're going to be changing load. You might be changing tempos and doing Mm -hmm. an isometric or Mm -hmm. maybe a different stance, or maybe the load's Mm going to be on a different side, but Mm -hmm. for the most part, it's going to be a lot of repetition so that Mm -hmm. your female athlete is actually getting better at these movements. Mm -hmm. So some, something like a squat you're going to be doing it a lot, but you might be pausing in, in that bottom position just to make it a little bit more, more challenging. And then maybe mm-hmm. you'll, you'll up the load in, in the next few weeks or the next month. And mm-hmm. I just want parents to understand, look, if you have a program for your female athlete and it's constantly changing every single week and it's too much variety in the weight room, it's not a good program. You have to actually master these movement patterns for a long period of time. Emily, do you want to add on to that? Oh my goodness. Absolutely. There's a thing called progressive overload. And that also applies Mm to motor skill acquisition and that we have to progressively continue to do something in progressive, I mean, we have to do maybe a little more, add a little tempo, change it to allow for that movement to become rope. It has to be something that your your athlete isn't thinking about. She knows how to squat. And I think kind of bringing back to what we were talking about with Oshkod Slaughters is that mm-hmm. I've had scenarios in that where an ath- a parent is like, well, her knees hurt, so I don't want her squatting. And I bring up the, well, squatting is a human movement pattern. So we don't want to avoid something. Instead, we want to work within a range where she's not feeling pain. So where in the squat can we not feel pain? So maybe we only get to a quarter squat. Lovely. So can we pause? Can we pause where we start to feel a little discomfort? Pause and let's build some tolerance. Next week, don't do the same thing, but we're going to pause a little bit longer. Next week after that, we're going to pause. Maybe we can get a little lower because we've built more tolerance. And that's how we're going to progressively overload it because we're doing the same movement. We're changing based on where she's feeling. And by the end of, let's say, four to eight weeks, depending on her frequency of coming in, she our goal is to get her to do a full depth squat because that's how we're going to get her knee stronger. But by avoiding a movement pattern, yes, we're avoiding the experience of pain, but we're only setting this athlete up for a future experience of pain because we've never tackled the cause of that pain head on. Mm -hmm. That that's another important, important point. I think when the, the Osgood slaughter happens, people will want to shy away from any quad type movement. But like Mm -hmm. you said, there's, there's ways around it and maybe just go as low as you can tolerate or Mm -hmm. hold that bottom position or do an isometric. And I'm going to share like just one of our, one of our like go-to movements. Oops. Let me get this Mm -hmm. copy video link here. Hold on. Let me reset this page. Sorry guys, bear with me. So yeah, this is like one of our most like basic tests. Um, let me move it here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, just a, a lunge hold, and it exposes not only the the muscular endurance and, and tolerance of the quad, but it also exposes any asymmetry. So if she's kind of like swaying one way, swaying the other way and losing her balance, that could also be a core stability issue Mm -hmm. that, that needs to be addressed. So it's just a a good test of just so many things. And usually girls with Oshkosh slaughters, when they're doing lunge isometrics, they rarely experience pain. I don't think I've ever had anyone say it was a painful movement. Mm -hmm. And usually these isometrics do the trick with any type of knee pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isometrics have been found to provide a type of analgesic effect for pain. So if your athlete's knee hurts, lovely, let's get her into a a split squat or a lunge position and hold. And if we hold after she stands, her knee will feel better. Um, And that's one of the coolest parts of human movement and that let's not avoid pain. Let's Mm -hmm. figure out why we're feeling pain. Let's work around it and let's have a goal to be able to achieve a specific movement pattern. But Mm -hmm. isometrics are like, one of the most important types of, you know, variations that we can give for an athlete. So, Hey, your knee hurts. That's okay. We're going to do a split squat and we're going to pause at that position where you first start to feel a little pain and we're going to hold it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to stand and you're going to feel better. And we're going to keep driving in week to week to week to week until this pain goes away. 
Yeah. And just to define isometric for you guys, it's basically the muscle is still contracting and working, but the, the joint is not moving. So it's, it's really great for, for girls with, with knee pain. Now, um, as far as the during PHB, so you, you talked about how some adults might make some comments about their girl. Oh, well you're running so awkward or you keep tripping over yourself or Mm -hmm. I've heard this before and it breaks my heart. You gain weight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, captain obvious. I mean, (laughs) I just, I just want to let you guys know, like, (laughs) yes, like these things go on, but we don't need to like talk about it in like a condescending way. Um, Mm -hmm. sometimes like we don't even need to bring it up. We just need to equip her with the tools and that's strength training, speed training, deceleration Mm -hmm. training, and just really empowering her during that time. And like Emily said, there might be a decline in performance and we might just have to weather the storm Mm -hmm. and do what we can control for six to 12 months. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's hard with girls because boys, on the other hand, see those performance gains, whereas Mm -hmm. girls it's, it's not so much. So Mm -hmm. we just have to get through it, do what we can control. And then post PHB, she's had good training and now's the time to really keep going with the, the performance training, the power work, the advanced mm-hmm. speed programs that everyone wants at age eight, that's mm-hmm. post PHB. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh my, you said that you just like hit the nail on the head and that guys, our words matter. So one, if she's going through this little awkward stage, lovely. That means that she's following the process of being a human. Like, yay. That yeah. means your kid is developing. <laughs> like that's expected. So instead of like how we want to word it, like, let's say you're a parent and you're like, Oh, like you're noticing that your daughter is maybe moving a little awkwardly. Cause she just had a big growth spurt. And you're like, I don't really know. Instead of saying, Oh, you put on a little weight. Oh, Oh, you're moving weird. Instead, you can be like, Oh, wow you're hitting a point in your life where you're hitting puberty. All of this is tip, very typical. It's time for us to really focus on training more so that we can really take advantage of the fact that you are developing. And that's it. And that's all you need to say, because she's aware. She's very much aware of the fact that her body is changing. And that it's is a hard time. It's like such a hard time. <laughs> There's such a psychological impact here that like, I think a lot of times we forget. I love it when I talk to a coach. I just talked to one yesterday. He was like a hundred percent. He's the male coach. And he's like, I don't know what to say to these girls. They're all going through puberty. I don't know what that's like. I don't know what having a period is like. How can I ever say anything about it? But I know it has to impact them. And I was like, oh my God, you might be the wisest dad I've ever met because it's so true. One, right? When we're talking about this peri PHB. So a year after these girls are going to get their onset of fancies, but there's so many other things now that we have to factor in when working with them. One is she going to experience some type of iron deficiency because iron deficiency anemia increases during this age group. So that's something to be aware of. Is she really fatigued? Is, is her sleeping different? We want to keep that in our, in, in, in our, in our mindset when we're working with them Two. These girls are now experiencing a thing called a period. This has never happened to them before. It's weird when you first get your period because you've never, you, what is going on? What is going on down below? You're not sure. That is stressful. It is stressful to have something going on to your body that you have no control over. And yet here it is. So we have to take in consideration one, did she first get her period? Is this still new for her? Because that's stressful because when it's still new, it's still figuring itself out. She doesn't know when it's coming. Has anyone even taught her how to track it? Is she using just like a calendar? Does she know what to expect? Also, she's probably growing some breasts and guess what? That's also awkward and a little bit painful when that's happening. So we have to take this into consideration and it's important. So, oh yes, your daughter's performance is decreasing, but her body is going through so many changes. We have to just accept this. It's like, I feel like if we go into this anticipating, my daughter is not going to be doing quite as well as she used to, but we're going to get her above and beyond. It's like, you have to take a step back before you can take two steps forward. And that's what this puberty period for girls is going to look like because she has to deal with so many other things. Also, we see a little bit of a rise of urinary incontinence during this period as well for this age group, because again, 
their hormones are out of whack or hormones are going to affect our bladder's elasticity. And that's going to affect our ability to kind of like keep things in there when we're running and jumping. So your daughter may be experiencing this. And this is something that like she feels awkward about. So it's important to have female role models that can talk to these girls about it because these changes are going on. And even though we as adults know, well, all of you guys are going through it. They're not thinking that way. And they're not, they haven't been taught how to communicate about this. And it's so important. With that, we also have to remember, lovely, she got her period. What if she didn't? What if she's 16 and she didn't get her period? That's a big alarm signal. Yeah, she's kicking butt on the soccer field, but inside her body is not kicking butt. So yeah, maybe you didn't really see a big decrease in performance, but physiologically, she is decreasing. Things are not going the way that they should. And that's something we have to discuss because her overall health needs to be more important. Athlete is, or person is more in person and more important than the athlete. And then with that, we also have to acknowledge that eating disorders are very prevalent within this population at this time. Why? Well, because their bodies are changing. They have no control over it. And we live in a world where there's certain pictures of how the female body should look in their faces 24 seven. And they don't really understand that no, most females don't look this way. No, your body will probably never look this way. And that's normal because this is abnormal. This picture that you're seeing all the time on social media has been adjusted. It has been edited Mm -hmm. and that's okay. And we have to acknowledge that these are all things that the female athlete is experiencing during this, you know, period right after that peak height velocity. And it's going to impact her performance, her speed, her agility, all of them will be impacted, but it doesn't mean they're impacted forever. It just means she's developing. We have to consider the person above the athlete during this time period and give her the tools and the mentorship to focus on herself as an athlete and as a person first. There's so much that goes on during this time and you just broke that down so nicely. And I think you're right. I think, I mean, this is obviously why we did this podcast. We want parents and coaches to know what to expect going in. So it's not as flooring when, when it happens and you see your daughter who was the fastest on the field at age eight and the best soccer player out there. But then as soon as she gets her period and hits puberty at age 12, not so much. She might be the slowest one out there. And Mm -hmm. we just don't want to try to go against nature and this, this natural process, we can only do what we can control. And what we talked Mm -hmm. about in this podcast, as far as the, the proper performance training, and we'll do another episode on nutrition as well, because that Mm -hmm. plays a role, especially with hormonal function. And also the eating disorder discussion is, is very serious. And when we get into things like the female athlete triad, the low uh, low bone mineral density, the menstrual dysfunction, the low energy availability. Um, I'm going to link a blog on that below in the caption. So be sure to check that out. That's something that needs to be taken seriously. Um, having missed periods is not a badge of honor and medical advice needs to, needs to be sought after and just working Mm -hmm. with someone, but yeah, there's a lot going on during this time, but the good news is, is we can surround her with the right female role models. We can give her a performance coach who understands female athlete growth Mm -hmm. and maturation and training. So that's the, that's the good news. I mean, there there's ways to just really empower her. And Emily, I want you to talk about like some of your experiences with your athletes, but with some of the girls I've worked with during this time, doing that, that strength training gives them a newfound confidence because Mm -hmm. they're just overcoming so much challenge in the Mm -hmm. gym and they're Mm -hmm. finding out what they are capable of even during Mm -hmm. this awkward time, or they're learning sprint mechanics. They're getting in two to three times a week. And they're like, wow, like I do have control over this. I can Mm -hmm. practice this and kind of undo some of this awkwardness. If I, if I work towards it and I've just Mm -hmm. seen such a burst in confidence and joy and love for training Mm -hmm. during this time. And honestly, I think the worst thing 
people can do during this time is not to strength train Mm -hmm. (laughs) and to just let her go on just like playing her sport over and over again and and Mm -hmm. not working on her body. I think that's the worst thing you can do during this time. Do you have anything to say as far as athletes you've worked with? And 100%, I think the worst thing you can do for your athlete is just keep pushing her into sport and pushing her into sport and pushing her into sport and not giving her any of the tools to improve at that sport, because you're just going to, you're setting yourself up for this kid to be frustrated. And like you said, I actually was just talking to my officer, my office manager about this, who once she doesn't train our athletes, but she sees them and it's interacts with them every day. And I asked her, you know, what is probably one of the most feeling parts of working, you know, in your position? And she's like the confidence I've seen girls sit in the chair on their first day crying because they are scared and literally a month later, they come hopping in, skipping because they're so confident. I I always say that it's it's, it's an amazing thing. When you put a barbell on a girl's hands, you change her life. You change her life. And it's it's so cool. It's so cool because you get to be part of it. But it's like, for me, I think the same thing. Why wouldn't you give your daughter that? There's literally, (laughs) why wouldn't you give that to her? Why? I mean, we all know what it was like to grow up and go through that puberty time, which is like the worst time ever. So why wouldn't you give your daughter the one tool that you know is going to help improve her confidence in herself? And it's going to also reduce the risk of injury. It's also going to enhance her performance. At the end of the day, like we said, this person is way more important than whatever sport she is. So let's build her. Let's build her up from the inside out. And strength training is going to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and we talked about in some of our other discussions, just really building those habits young because mm-hmm. the sport will end. It will mm-hmm. end. And she still needs to learn how to take care of her body and regulate her hormones with training and mm-hmm. nutrition and recovery. So it's just, it's just good for life being that, mm-hmm. that lifelong athlete and that, that human who can move and still be vibrant in old age. It doesn't mm-hmm. need to get worse as you get older. And I've definitely learned that because mm-hmm. of the power of strength training. And I, I have definitely noticed like girls who do start Emily, they're scared, they're timid. They might be the quietest in the facility, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then like even just a month later, they're the most social. They're chatting it up with the girls that are seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where did this come from? Right. Oh yeah. Like you gain confidence in yourself. You overcame Mm -hmm. challenge. You, you failed in the gym at times, but then you overcame it again. I mean, Mm -hmm. I just can't speak enough on how powerful this stuff is. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Seriously. It's, it's literally like, if you wanted like the magic, the magic pill, here it is. Um, (laughs) literally here it is. It exists. And we all need to jump on board with it sooner than later, because it is almost 2023 and just doing like playing your sport. It's not enough. It's not going to have the same impact. Give her this tool because it's going to have such an impact on her now and forever. I'm going to include the episode we did on the sport specific load to muscular strength and that ratio and, Mm -hmm. and why those need to be balanced out. So we have Mm -hmm. a buffer of of muscular strength to handle that load. So Mm -hmm. I know I'm giving everyone resources in the caption, but you got homework, you guys. So look in the caption below, check out Mm -hmm. all the studies. I'm going to link Emily's website programs, as well as Instagram there. And then some of our older episodes for you to refer back to. This has been awesome. If you guys like this episode, like the video, please. So that Emily can come back on. We'll do another (laughs) one. I mean, there's so much we can talk about, but Emily, do you have any closing words? Oh, it's, it's just kind of, like I said, it's amazing what can happen when you put a barbell in a girl's hands, whether she's pre PHB, post PHB, it's going to have an amazing impact. And like you said, it's probably one of the most important things that you can do for your athlete. I love it. We'll end there. Those are some powerful words. And we hope you guys enjoyed this discussion on training the youth female athlete pre, during, and post PHV. And we'll come back another time to to get more into it. So Emily, thank you again. And thank you guys next time. Sounds great.